Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Live with Lon today. We're so glad you joined us. And we're going to be talking today uh, from our continuing study in the Gospels about a very current and important subject that every single one of us, I, I guarantee you, um, is dealing with in our own life. You say, well, that's a pretty big statement. Well, I'm right. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is forgiveness. So before we do that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word, which brings light to our path and a lamp to our feet and uh, allows us, Lord Jesus, to uh, understand exactly what you expect from us and what you want from us first regarding salvation and then regarding uh, the, the life we live once we become children of God. So speak to us deeply today, Lord, about a problem and an issue that every one of us grapples with, the issue of forgiveness. May our hearts be open and soft uh, before you and your word today. And Father, I thank you for this vaccine uh, that uh, seems to be imminent by the time this prayer is broadcast, one vaccine may have already been approved. And we love you and we thank you for your mercy, Lord. Uh, but we realize everyone won't be able to get it right away. And for many of us, our Christmas will be very different this year. Uh, we won't be going uh, to see and gathering with relatives and friends like normal. So God, for us, that means it could be a very lonely uh, and, and sad uh, Christmas. So Lord, encourage our hearts that you have uh, somehow, some way uh, in your plan for the ages uh, designed Christmas 2020 to be this way and help us, Lord Jesus, to be able to rise above that sadness in our hearts and still praise God for the gift he gave us of the Lord Jesus Christ at Christmas. Now, Lord, use your word in our life in a mighty way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Okay. Well, um, we're studying the Gospels, as you know. Uh, we're doing the Bible, the whole Bible. Say it with me. And nothing but the Bible. That's right. And we come today to Matthew chapter 18, where we uh, have the Lord Jesus speaking to us as uh, believers about forgiveness. Now, let me just say uh, uh, preemptorily uh, that if you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you may find today's uh, message to be interesting. Uh, you may even find it to be intellectually challenging. But you will never be able uh, to understand uh, the gripping nature of this parable that Jesus tells and the truth that he uh, expostulates in this parable until you have experienced the unbelievable, uh, unsurpassing mercy and forgiveness of the Savior for your sins uh, that's when this parable really becomes the powerful thing that it is. And uh, so if you are here and you know Christ, however, uh, this is a, for us, this parable, it's for you and me, and its power should affect us deeply. So uh, with that little introduction, here we go. All right, Matthew chapter 18, we're using our uh, New King James the version of the Bible, and we're picking up at verse 21. Then Peter came to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now, this uh, comment by Peter does not just come out of the blue. Uh, it looks like it does if you just start there at verse 21. But I want you to go back. Remember, a text without a context is a pretext. If you go back to verse 15, Jesus started this discussion of forgiveness by saying, 
Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, then take one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. This passage goes on to say if he doesn't listen to them, eventually you get to church discipline, uh, but that's not, the, that's not what we're going to talk about today. The point is, if you go to your brother and you tell him his fault, what he did to hurt you, and he acknowledges that, then implicit in you having won your brother, hear what Jesus says, is that you have to forgive your brother once he uh, owns up to what he did wrong. So this subject of forgiveness uh, was not brought up by Peter. Here, uh, as you look at it in verse 21, it was actually brought up by the Lord Jesus Christ back in verse 15, when the whole idea of what he's talking about, intrinsic in it, is forgiveness. And this is what motivates Peter to say, well then, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? Remember verse 15, if your brother sins against you, Peter says, how often? Uh, uh, must I forgive him? Uh, up to seven times? And uh, Peter thought that he was really going above and beyond the call of duty by saying seven times? You know, if my brother walks up and boom, hits me in the mouth and then says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, and I say, I forgive you. And then my brother comes up to me uh, the next day, and pow, hits me in the mouth and says, oh, I'm sorry. And I say, I'll forgive you. And then he walks up the next day, pow, and he hits me in the mouth. And then he says, oh, I'm sorry. And you say, oh, it's okay, I, I forgive you. Uh, uh, how many times do I, if I do that seven times, I'll get to the point where I won't be able to hardly talk. I, I, I forgive you. You see what Peter's saying? He's saying, my gosh, seven times. That's over and above uh, the call of duty. And the Lord corrects him. See, intrinsic in Peter's question, how many times do I have to forgive him, is a, is a mistaken notion that at some point it becomes okay not to forgive your brother or your sister. You understand? Uh, and Jesus corrects him and says, uh, no, I do not say to you up to seven times, verse 22, but up to 70 times seven, 490 times. You say, Okay, well, the, does that mean on the 491st time I can refuse to forgive him? No, no, Jesus is trying to make a, a hyperbolic statement here that, that you have to no, know there's never a time when you can refuse to forgive other people as a believer. And to press this point home, he tells a parable. It's called the parable of the unmerciful or the unforgiving servant. And uh, remember, a parable has one main point that it's trying to press home. Uh, a parable is a story. Uh, we haven't talked much about parables yet, but we're going to get into a bunch of them. Uh, it's a story that has one main lesson. And uh, so you don't try to make the parable walk on all fours. Jesus, you know, every detail of the parable is not necessarily uh, an authentic event. Uh, it's a story to make a point. Okay, so here we go. Here comes the parable, and it's about what's the point of the parable? What's it about? What subject? Well, come on, what? Forgiveness, of course. Okay, here we go. Therefore, verse 23, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one of them was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents uh, is somewhere in the range of $10 million, uh, give or take. So this is an enormous amount uh, of money uh, that, that a servant would never be able to pay back. You say, well, how did he run up a debt that big? And why did the master keep letting him borrow? What I tell you about parables, friends? <laughs> We don't have to know all of that. It's a story. Okay. The point is he held the, the king at an unpayable amount. 
But in so much as he was not able to pay, verse 25, his master commanded that he, his wife, and children, and all that he had be sold, and payment be made. And the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Now, uh, that I owe you, could he ever do that? Of course not. He doesn't even have the chutzpah to ask the master to completely forgive it. That, that, would, be, that would be beyond uh, comprehension that the master would forgive a debt like that. He just said, let, let, I'll work hard and I'll try to pay it off. And the master of that servant, verse 27, was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Wiped it out. $10 million. The whole debt. Just wiped it out. Now, um, that's the end of scene one. Scene two in the parable. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A denarius was a little tiny silver coin. The Roman, Roman silver coin. Uh, this is maybe... Oh, somewhere between fifteen and a hundred dollars. Uh, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, "Pay me what you owe me." The forgiven servant to the servant that owed him money. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, "Have patience with me, and I will pay you all." Uh, do, do you notice something here? Those are the exact same words exactly, that the forgiven servant said to the king uh, in, in Greek. They're the exact same words. Now, but the response is different. Verse 30, but the forgiven servant, he would not, but went and threw the man who owed him 50 to 100 bucks into prison until he should pay the debt. End of scene two. So here we have in scene two, uh, this man who had received infinite mercy and forgiveness, refusing to show even the smallest mercy and forgiveness to his fellow man. You with me? Now, scene three, and finally, begins in verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved, and they came and told their master, the king, all that had been done. And then his master, after he had called the forgiven servant in, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt that you owed me because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Uh, this is the key point. Uh, the offense of the forgiven servant to not forgive his fellow man would not have been so bad and, and so egregious if he himself, the forgiven servant, hadn't just been forgiven a massive debt he could never repay. What made his actions towards his fellow servant so uh, repulsive is that he had received infinite mercy and he wouldn't even show the smallest mercy to his fellow man. You with me? And the master says to him, how dare you? How dare you refuse to show mercy to somebody else after the mercy I, I showed you, you wicked servant? Now, let's finish the passage in verse 34. And his master was angry. And delivered him up to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him, which would never happen. So he went to the torturers. He went to jail for the rest of his life. Now, watch what Jesus says. So, my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you, from his heart, her heart, does not forgive his, her brother, his trespasses. Wow. So shall my father do to you as a believer. Remember, this parable is for believers. Uh, because 
we, only we really fully understand the dynamics of this parable. Now, does this mean you'll lose your salvation? No. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I give my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. And you became a child of God and God does not uh, uh, cast his children away. No, no, no. Jesus doesn't mean you'll lose your salvation here. Jesus simply means that hey, I come to God all the time with unbelievable, uh, crazy, stupid things that I've done. Just, I mean, just stupid, sinful things that I've done. And I beg God to forgive me. And many times I beg God to dust my trail because if things worked absolutely wrong, now I could get in big trouble uh, for maybe something I had done foolishly. And I ask God, God, please don't uh, let this catch up with me. Please dust my trail, Lord. Uh, uh, if I said something horrible, uh, please don't let it get out and become public domain and cause me to disgrace myself and you. You understand what I'm saying? And God does that for us over and over and over and over again. I can't tell you how many times he's done it for me. Well, what God simply means is that level of mercy, that level of forgiveness and covering my bases, that God is going to be less apt and willing to do that for me if I don't have that same attitude of forgiveness towards my fellow man. And this is even in the Bible. Well, look, what, uh, look at James chapter 2, verse 13. Here's what it says. It says, for judgment, verse 13, is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. God will not be as quick to cover my sins, cover my tracks, um, be compassionate when I do stupid stuff I know better. He will not be as quick to do that for me in everyday living. Uh, if I don't have an ad, that same attitude of mercy, forgiveness, and clemency towards my brother. This is what Jesus is saying. Now, I don't know about you. I can't afford that. No, no. I cannot afford for God not to have infinite mercy, infinite patience, infinite long-suffering, infinite forgiveness, infamous, uh, not infamous, <laughs> Uh, uh, unlimited of of of, of uh, dust in my trail. <laughs> I can't afford that because I do too much stupid stuff. Well, if I don't want God to withdraw some of that mercy from me, then friends, I I have no business not showing that mercy to other people. You with me? Okay. Now that brings us to the end of our parable. And But it brings us to our most important question. What's our most important question? You know what it is all together. Ready? One, two, three. So what? <laughs> yeah. And to be back after open heart surgery and preaching the word and be able to scream, so what? I only have one response to that. And you know what it is. Say it with me. How sweet it is. You're right. Now, this parable and, and uh, it has application to every single one of us as a follower of Jesus Christ. Because every single one of us struggles with forgiveness uh, for, for people who've hurt us. Uh, whether it's a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, an ex-husband, an ex-wife, uh, an ex-boyfriend, an ex-girlfriend, someone at work, um, our children, uh, uh, it, 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 a neighbor... Uh, uh, we all struggle with this. And so listen up, uh, because this is for us, every one of us. Now, uh, let's define forgiveness. What does forgiveness mean? Forgiveness means it's an act of my will. It's not a feeling. It's an act of my will where I commit myself to let the other person off the hook as far as I'm concerned. And we'll talk about in a minute, do they really get off the hook um, uh, universally? No, no. But I let them off the hook as far as I'm concerned. And 
uh, uh, it's a it's a commitment of my heart where I say I forgive you, and I am declaring what you did to me ancient history. I'm 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 declaring it a water under the bridge, and I'm not going to bring it up to you ever again. I'm not going to bring it up to God ever again, and most importantly, I'm not going to bring it up to myself ever again. It's like scar tissue. It has no no feeling there's no nerves in scar tissue and and it it doesn't hurt anymore it's ancient history now you say lawn that's wonderful but this the people i know that i am having trouble forgiving they hurt me so badly uh, that uh, that they damage me so badly uh, i don't think i could ever uh uh, d declare what they did to me, ancient history. I don't think I, I could, could ever uh, just let it turn into scar tissue and turn loose of it like this. Well, my friends, I understand. I understand. Uh, uh, I, I had that exact same feeling towards my mother, my Jewish mother. She hurt me and damaged me so badly. Um, if any of you know what uh, disassociative disorder is, uh, that's what she caused in me. Right? Look it up. Google it. Uh, dissociative uh, disorder. It's a horrible uh, emotional condition uh, that this woman caused in me. And I didn't, I, I've hated her all my life. I didn't think I could ever forgive her for what she did to me. She was cruel to me. She was abusive to me verbally. And she, she was mean, just mean to me. Uh, sometimes she wouldn't talk to me if she was mad at me for a week or two at a time. I'm a little kid and my mother won't even speak to me. You talk about damage. But you know what? When I read this parable, I realized I have no choice but to forgive this woman. And why is that? Why is that? Well, let me tell you why. It's because of how Jesus forgave us. See, that's why you don't get the power of this parable unless you've been forgiven uh, by the Lord Jesus, unless you've had your sins wiped clean, uh, the, the, the millions of dollars of them by Jesus. Look what Colossians chapter 2 says. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with Christ having forgiven you, what's the next word? What's the next word? Say it. All trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us by the law, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way. All of our sin, watch, having nailed it to his cross. Folks, we're the servant that owed God the millions of dollars and God took it all out of the way. He forgave all of us, all of it, by nailing it to the cross. And we understand what it means to be forgiven, an unpayable debt that would have sent us to hell. And yet God in his mercy, in this parable, he's the king, had compassion on us and forgave us. And this is exactly what God tells us, my friends. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, look. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, watch, even as Christ forgave you. And how did he forgive you and me? He forgave us all, freely, a debt we could never pay. Even as Christ forgave you, so you do also. And look back in, in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, look, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. We are that middle, that forgiven servant. And we have no right to refuse to forgive our fellow man in light of how much God has forgiven us. This is the story, this is the point of the parable. In light of how much God has forgiven you and me as believers in Jesus, 
we have no right to refuse to forgive anyone for anything that they have ever done to us. Now, I've got five little caveats that go along with this, and we'll cover them and then we're done, and they're quick. Oh, and let me say, before I get into these caveats, you might ask, where does the power uh, to forgive a, my fellow man come from? Because, Lon, I'm not sure I've got the power inside of me. Friends, it comes from the Holy Spirit. He has to heal that wound inside of us. He has to give us the ability to declare it ancient history. He has to give us the power to say to that person, I forgive you. And to do it from the heart, remember Jesus said we have to give, uh, so will our Heavenly Father do to us if we do not forgive from the heart. Uh, uh, God knows whether we are doing it from the heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do it. And that leads me to caveat number one. Caveat number one is that sometimes it takes a while to be able to do this. Uh, uh, sometimes when the hurt is deep, we just don't snap our fingers and say, I forgive you. Uh, no, it takes time uh, in prayer and seeking God and asking God to do a Holy Spirit work in our heart to enable us to forgive. It took me two years once I realized God expected me to uh, forgive my mother. It took me two years on my knees begging God to enable me to forgive my mother before Something incredible happened in my soul, and I can't tell you exactly what it was because I don't fully understand it myself, but suddenly the Holy Spirit had taken the poison uh, out of the wound, had squeezed the, the pus out of the wound, and it became scar tissue, and I could forgive my mother. So that's my first caveat. Sometimes it takes a while. Caveat number two is that forgiveness does not mean making light of what they did to you. No, no. I'm not asking you to say, oh, well, it wasn't a big deal. And it was a big deal. Are you kidding? It was a huge deal what they did to you and what my mother did to me. Uh, forgiveness doesn't mean that we go, oh, uh, no worries, mate. Uh, no, no. Uh, we, uh, forgiveness means that, yes, we understand the seriousness and the damage of what they did. Uh, it's just that we say to them, you know, it was not all right what you did to me then. It was not all right, but it's okay now. God has enabled me now to declare it ancient history and make it scar tissue, and it's okay now, but it was not okay what you did to me. Uh, thir the third caveat is forgiveness does not mean that people get away with the things they've done to us, that there's never any reckoning for them and never any payback for them. No, no, no. Uh-uh. Look with me, if you would, at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, my friends, is the Magna Carta of forgiveness in the New Testament. And here's what it says. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If possible, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Now, why does Paul say, if possible, as much as it lies with you, be at peace with all men? Well, friends, David said it in the Psalms. I was for peace, but they were for war. I mean, sometimes you can't be at peace with everybody, not because you haven't forgiven them, but because they're still mad at you, they still dislike you, they still hate you, and they, they're for war. So that's why Paul, being a realist, said, if possible, as much as it lies with you, you can't control what they do, but you can control you. As much as it lies with you, be at peace with all men. What this means is there, uh, that I'm in a condition where no matter who it is, and no matter what they did to me, when their name comes up, I'm at peace because I've forgiven them. You understand? And you, buddy, look, it goes on and says, a Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, verse 19, but rather give place for wrath, for God's wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. 
So uh, they're not going to, this is caveat number three, they're not going to get away with what they did. No, no, nobody gets away with anything in our world. Uh, it's just that God's going to avenge the wrong they did to you instead of you avenging it. Uh, if you're going to avenge it, you can't forgive them. Uh, vengeance and forgiveness can't, can't be in bed together. Uh, they're, you know, it's one or the other. Either you're going to take vengeance or you're going to forgive them, but you can't do both. And God says, you forgive, I'll avenge. You ready? Watch this. You forgive, I'll avenge. That's what God says. And once you're willing to accept the fact, my friend, that God is going to be the avenger, uh, then that helps with the forgiveness. Uh, because uh, how can we forgive them if they're going to get away with the horrible thing they did? But they're not. It's just that you're not going to avenge. Okay? Uh, that's caveat number three. Caveat number four is that forgiveness often needs a booster shot. I'm thinking of this vaccine that's coming out for the coronavirus. And you take one shot, and then three or four weeks later, you take a second booster shot. Uh, and of tetanus, you need a booster every 10 years for your tetanus uh, shot. Yeah, uh, forgiveness uh, sometimes needs booster shots. You say, what do you mean? I mean, look, uh, some, we, we can forgive with all of our heart. And then sometimes the unforgiveness in, th that we were caught up in for years rears its ugly head. We hear the person's name. And before we can even catch it, all of a sudden, we're thinking horrible things and we're like this. Uh, or, or somebody mentions something about what they did and we're like, and we can feel it in our stomach. We can feel the anger and the hatred and the malice uh, uh, coming back and the unforgiveness. And we need to give ourselves a booster shot. We need to go back and we need to go through this whole thing again and say, Lord, no, I forgave them. No, Lord, I'm not going to avenge. You're going to do it. And we have to put this uh, thing to bed again. And that's perfectly normal uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, unforgiveness rises from the dead in our life. And it doesn't mean you haven't really forgiven. Uh, it just means that that's the way uh, we are. Satan stirs it up in our hearts and it rises from the dead. And we have to come back and we have to bury it again at the foot of the cross. And caveat number five is that this is the only way we can move on with our life. Uh, friend, if we don't forgive, we are stuck on top dead center in the spiritual uh, growth and the emotional growth in our life. We must forgive. It's the only way that we're able to move on with our life and serve the Lord Jesus Christ in a healthy uh, and wholesome way. And it's the only way uh, we can love other people and help other people in a healthy way is that we have forgiven. And as far as it lies with us, you know, we're at peace with all men. That is a massive statement. To be able to say, as far as I know, I'm not harboring malice or unforgiveness towards anybody for what they've done to me. That's a massive statement to be able to say that. You know, but that's how we move on with our life. Uh, that unforgiveness will keep you stuck, like I said, on top dead center, emotionally and spiritually for months or even years until that unforgiveness is buried at the foot of the cross. And I know because it kept me that way for years, that unforgiveness for my mom. And so unforgiveness uh, is, a, is dangerous. And God's command for us to forgive is for your benefit. This is why he commands us to do it. It's because it's good for you. You need to forgive in order to be a healthy person. And me too. I'll just close by saying, after two years of praying for my mom and finally forgiving her in my heart, I saw her not long after that at a uh, party. that I went down for her birthday party into, to Atlanta, Georgia, where she was living. And after the party was over and she'd had too much to drink, <laughs> yeah, uh, but that loosened up her tongue, uh, we were cleaning up and she turned to me out of the blue. Some of you have heard me tell this. I mean, no, no context at all. And she just said to me, Lon, 
you've hated me all of your life, haven't you? And I thought, oh boy, here's my moment to tell her I've forgiven her. Uh, but I had to be honest. And I said, yes, mom, I've hated you from the time I can remember as a little child. Uh, and she said, why? And I said, why? Uh, because you abused me, because you were mean to me, because you tried to control me, because you stifled my growth, because, and I went on with all the reasons uh, that, that I hated her. Uh, and I said, but mom, I want to tell you something. Because of what Jesus has done in my heart, and only because of that, because of what the Lord Jesus has done in my heart, I have forgiven you. It wasn't okay what you did to me back then, Mom. But it's okay now. So why don't we just declare an ancient history and let's move on. And we gave each other a hug. It was the first time that I had ever hugged my mother and meant it. She used to make me hug her before she, I would ever leave the house or she would ever leave. I hated that. Come here, give me a hug. I want to give you a hug. It doesn't matter. I hated that. But this time I meant it. And my mom eventually came to Christ not too long after that when she did, when she, uh, as she was dying. And I believe that it was that act of forgiveness and being able to tell her about it that played a major part in her being able to come to the Lord. And, and so in closing, what's the bottom line for today? Well, here it is, Matthew chapter 18. Should not you also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you. So my heavenly Father also will do to each one of you if from his heart he does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And as Paul said, as the Lord Jesus forgave us, so also do ye. We do. That's it. Let me say in closing, I know many of you are out there going, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure I can do it. Uh, friends, you can. If I can forgive my mother, you can forgive anybody. Like I say, it may, it may not happen today. But if you get on your knees and you ask God, God, I understand I have to forgive them. There is no option. Please help me. Please, by the Holy Spirit, change this venom in my heart to forgiveness and to compassion for them, and to scar tissue. I don't know how God does it. I don't know how he did it for me. It doesn't matter what difference it make. He did it, and he'll do it for you. If you're serious and you really want to forgive, and I hope you are, let's pray. And with our heads uh, bowed and our eyes closed, I want you to take a minute. And I want you to think of that person or persons that you have never forgiven for what they've done to you. And now, I hope that you will be able to say, Lord Jesus, give me the power and I will forgive them. I don't have the power. But Lord, I mean it. I'm serious. You change my heart. You give me the power. And I will forgive them. Can you say that for them? I hope so. Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking to us about a topic today that we all grapple with. And thanks for reminding us. Uh, that you're not asking us to forgive for your benefit. Lord, it's for our benefit. It's so that we can move on with life and live a healthy and functional life and not be paralyzed at some point uh, with, with unforgiveness. Lord Jesus, give us the heart to say, I'll forgive them, Lord, if you'll give me the power and to mean it. And we pray this. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Okay, my friends, next week, Live with Lon again. Hope you'll join us. 
And I hope today, I tell you, if you'll forgive when God gives you the ability, today's message will be a life-altering message for every one of us.